Today, I hope to offer a theological critique of penal substitutionary atonement. This is the theory that states that God punished Jesus on the cross in our place, appeasing the wrath of God, satisfying the justice of God, and fulfilling God's inherent need to punish sin. Or simply put, satisfaction through substitution, as John R. W. Stott writes. This theory is the predominant atonement model of the Protestant Church, especially the Evangelical and Reformed. Um, personally, it was the theory I learned growing up. It was my first experience um, with the gospel uh, before I ever even called it an atonement theory. But then as I began to study theology more seriously for myself, uh, this was also one of the first doctrines that I deconstructed and ultimately came to reject. Uh, so in this video, I want to explain the theological reasons why I am emphatically against this atonement theory and have been for many years now. In part two, I will offer a biblical critique of PSA, but that will build upon this argument, so it is important to watch them in order. Now, I first want to say, before we get started, that I realize in criticizing PSA, uh, many who hold this as central to the gospel will feel threatened by it and will potentially respond with hostility. Now, I hope that you can be a bit more charitable towards what I'm saying here and that you can think through some of these critiques um, and hopefully see them in a better light and not uh, respond just with a knee-jerk reaction. Um, because you do well to remember that no ecumenical creed, uh, such as the Nicene or the Apostles' Creed, make an atonement theory the litmus test for orthodoxy. Um, and that is for very good reason, because we do not confess a set of concepts or theories. Uh, rather, we confess the person of Jesus Christ. Now, with that out of the way, let's get to the first critique. So now the first critique I'd like to suggest is that PSA presupposes a different concept of justice than the one that Christ proclaimed, and that it then reinterprets the gospel according to the law of retribution rather than according to the love of God revealed in Christ which restores and heals. In other words, PSA presupposes an unchristian concept of justice that is fundamentally at odds with the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. This is the central error of PSA because it informs its conceptual framework and thus determines its conclusions and taints its reading of Scripture. Now, this argument comes from what I would consider to be the best book-length critique of PSA, um, which is Darren W. Snyder Belosek's Atonement, Justice, and Peace. Um, this is an excellent book. Um, I'm pulling from it a lot in these videos, um, even though I'll also be um, borrowing a lot from T.F. Torrance, Carl Barth, and other theologians as well. Uh, but this book is... Um, exceptionally good and one of its first arguments is the same argument about the different concepts of justice. And so Belosek summarizes this argument like this. The penal substitution theory is based squarely on the logic of retributive justice, yet as we will also argue, Jesus, through both his teaching and his cross, shows us the just ways of God that transcend retribution for the sake of redemption. Thus, PSA is a failure to understand the cross on its own terms on Jesus' own terms. Instead, this theory imposes a contradictory notion of justice onto the cross and thus distorts its essential meaning. Belosek stresses that the death of Christ must be seen as consistent and continuous with the life and resurrection of Christ. His death is not an anomaly, in other words, but the culmination of Christ's words and deeds. So the life of Christ must inform our understanding of his death, and proponents of PSA ignore the unity of Christ's life and death at their own peril. As Belosek sees it, Christ's central proclamation is the kingdom of God, which is starkly contrasted against all human kingdoms, and thus we can call it an upside-down kingdom. And one of the most distinctive features of God's upside-down kingdom is the renunciation of retributive justice together with the declaration of a higher form of justice, which transcends an eye-for-an-eye legalism. Thus, Belosek concludes, Therefore, because the cross of Jesus Christ is the definitive revelation of the kingdom of God, and because renouncing retribution is essential to Jesus' proclamation and enacting God's kingdom, any theology that interprets the cross of Jesus as the ultimate satisfaction of retribution obscures rather than reveals God's kingdom of justice and peace. That is, the cross interpreted in terms of satisfying the law of retribution is something other than 
the cross of Jesus Christ. So we must go to school with Jesus and learn the nature of God's justice in this upside down kingdom. The error of PSA then is to interpret the cross according to a human made notion of justice which we have presupposed from our earthly kingdoms and laws rather than according to the kingdom of God proclaimed in Jesus Christ. To explain this further, let's look at a key passage in the gospel to see exactly what this means. In Matthew 5, Jesus rejects a classic concept of justice known as the lex talionis, or the law of retaliation. He does so in verses 38 through 35. While these are likely familiar sayings to you, try to think of this with fresh eyes in the context of the atonement. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. I suspect that because of our familiarity with this verse, we undervalue just how radical it is for our notions of justice. This is the upside-down kingdom of God, which is no longer based upon human laws, where justice means retaliation or retribution, but rather it is a kingdom of love and mercy, where justice means restoration, and where it is rooted in the law of love, not punishment. Thus, true justice in the kingdom of God is to be healed and set free, not to get your pound of flesh as payback. It is important to recognize how Christ links this ethic with the Father. We are like the Father, not when we demand punishment and an eye for an eye, but when we forgive and act justly by restoring our enemies to a right relationship with us, that is, when we choose love over retaliation and violence. Just as God sends good gifts to the deserving and undeserving alike, God's justice transcends the lex talionis. I want to stress here that we must recognize these words as Christ's definition of God's justice. The great 20th century theologian Karl Barth has stressed that the nature of God must be defined exclusively in terms of Jesus Christ. And if we seek after a nature of God behind the back of Jesus, we are in error. Instead, as Paul writes, Christ is the image of the invisible God. So we have learned that God's concept of justice is explicitly against the law of retaliation, the lex talionis. Yet classic defenders of PSA have presupposed the very same notion of justice and made it the linchpin of their doctrine of the atonement. Belisek proves this by examining a passage from Charles Hodge, whose orthodoxy among the Protestant and Reformed is unquestioned. Hodge writes in volume 2 of his Systematic Theology. Hence the plan of salvation, which the Bible reveals, supposes that the justice of God, which renders the punishment of sin necessary, has been satisfied. Men can be pardoned and restored to the favor of God, because the penalty due to us was laid on him, Christ. It is clear, therefore, that the scriptures recognize the truth that God is just in the sense that he is determined by his moral excellence to punish all sin, and therefore that the satisfaction of Christ, which secures the pardon of sinners, is rendered to the justice of God. Its primary and principal design is neither to make a moral impression upon offenders themselves, nor to operate didactically on other intelligent creature, but to satisfy the demands of justice so that God can be just in justifying the ungodly. To this, Belosek comments, the linchpin of the logic of penal substitution, as Hodge emphasizes, is the principle of retributive justice. Belosek then goes to quote Hodge, who says exactly this point. There is no force in this argument unless there is a necessity for the punishment of sin. This demand for legal justice is the driving force behind the theory of penal substitution, and it rests upon a concept of justice according to God's adherence to the lex talionis, the law of retribution. Thus, it is said that God must repay an eye for an eye, that is, God must punish sin in equal measure, and that this is the nature of God's justice. But as we have seen, it is a false presupposition to define God's justice in this way, because that is not how Jesus interpreted God's justice 
in his teaching. So if the very linchpin of PSA is rejected by Christ himself, then where does this leave the theory? Either we continue to hold on to our own twisted notions of justice, wherein God demands payment for sin, or we drop those and embrace Christ's ethic regarding justice. And thus we will see that God does not demand punishment, but God desires to heal and restore. God became a man in Jesus not to satisfy some legal demand in God, but to heal humanity from sin, to deliver us from the darkness and despair of our existence. So in the final analysis, PSA is a complete failure to Christianize our concept of the cross according to the words and deeds of Christ himself. Now take a look at this image from the ministry Desiring God. This quote makes the problematic claim that the cross is about God saving us from God. But this claim is already implicit in PSA. It's not something new. It's not something extra to the theory. It is inherent to the theory itself. This is essentially what PSA is all about. Yet there is not only no biblical basis for this idea that we are saved from God, but this is a theologically deplorable way of thinking. To say that God saves us from God's self is nonsensical. God saves us from sin, not from God. Jesus does not come to fix God, but to fix us. It is about healing humanity and restoring us to right fellowship with God. We will return to this point, but I want to stress here that salvation is not a legal transaction that takes place between God to satisfy some sort of abstract law of retaliation. Salvation is the healing and restoring of our humanity. It is reconciliation and redemption. The gospel is the revelation that nothing not even sin, can separate us from God, as Paul writes in Romans 8. It is the good news that God loves us so much as to take sin as God's own and to heal our nature. God is like a surgeon who does not merely stand over us to heal our cancer, but enters into our body, taking up our flesh and bears away our cancerous and diseased existence, destroying it in his death. He takes the wounds of our sin upon himself not as some kind of arbitrary punishment to meet a false conception of justice, but because God makes atonement, because God heals us and saves us from sin. The sacrifice of the cross does not make atonement. Atonement is God's work, and sacrifice is the medium of its proclamation. Christ's death is not what produces atonement, in other words, but it is the result of God's atoning work. Atonement is a person. It is the whole life and work of Jesus Christ. His death puts to death our sin and destroys our diseased existence. Thus, he died because of atonement, not to enact atonement. Belisek makes an insightful observation in this regard. He realized that PSA reverses the cause-effect relationship of atonement because of its false framework of justice. He explains, In atoning sacrifice, God is the primary actor, not humans. Sacrifice atones, not because it satisfies God, but because God acts through it to make atonement. It is a common mistake to get the cause-effect relationship backwards and think that sacrifice is the cause and atonement the effect, and thus to think that sacrifice acts on God to effect atonement, making God the medium of the process. God is the actor, the atonement maker. Sacrifice is the medium. God acts to cleanse and forgive sinners by removing sin and pollution through sacrifice, thereby restoring covenant relationship. Divine justice is done here, but it is restorative justice, not retributive justice. So this is how we must understand the atonement according to the true nature of God's justice. God's justice demands restoration, not retribution. It is aimed towards healing our humanity and restoring us to God, not towards satisfying a legal requirement in God. Atonement is the cause of sacrifice, not the effect. That is, the sacrifice does not act on God. It is God acting on humanity. God is not the object of the atonement, the one being acted upon, but the one who makes atonement. God is the one acting as atonement maker. The faulty notion of justice held by PSA taints the narrative so that the cause and effect are essentially reversed. But the sacrifice does not make atonement. 
atonement is made, and then sacrifice follows. Thus, God heals our humanity and acts for our good, rather than satisfying some sort of transactional need in God's self. So it is because God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ and the kingdom he proclaimed that I reject penal substitution and its problematic notion of God's justice. Now, the second critique of penal substitution is that it makes the cross into a violent transaction rather than a nonviolent rescue based on relational love. And both implications are problematic mostly for the doctrine of God. We've already touched on some of these ideas, but I want to just give further consideration to this. The idea that the cross is some kind of transaction is central to penal substitution. God does not solve a problem in humanity. That is, God does not really heal or rescue us from sin in PSA, but God merely makes a payment in place of sin. It is thus a transaction that takes place over our head. A debt is paid, but no relationship is necessarily established by virtue of this exchange. Now, of course, defenders of PSA argue that uh, out of gratitude for what Christ has done, we will uh, devote ourselves to God, uh, but that relationship is not the immediate effect of the atonement. As it is in Scripture, um, God does not enact this union with us. Rather, he fixes some sort of internal contradiction within God's very self, within God's nature. And so the transactional heart of PSA thus undermines the very goal of the gospel. Furthermore, this transaction is described as an act of violence, wherein Christ suffers the punishment of God and God's wrath is poured out. Critics of PSA have rightly called attention to how this can seem like a, a case of cosmic child abuse. And with this, there is an implicit justification of violence, which is highly problematic. And now, whether or not it's fair to label PSA uh, cosmic child abuse is neither here nor there, because what I'm mostly concerned with here is the message that violence is validated as a means of our redemption. Uh, violence is lifted up as a valid form of solving conflict, of solving problems. But most of all, if the heart of the gospel is about reconciliation and union with God, then there is a clear disconnect between the means and the end of the atonement. We should also point out the problematic terminology that's used here by PSA when it claims that God cannot forgive sin without first being appeased. Now, this is essential to penal substitution. Um, God must get his pound of flesh. God must punish sin. God must punish Jesus in our place, and then God can forgive us. But can such a God be rightly called the God of boundless mercy? Or was the psalmist wrong in writing that his mercy is everlasting in Psalms 100? So PSA relies upon this idea that God must first fix some kind of problem that God has in God's self, fix God's own legal requirements in a transaction that takes place over our head. And this means that the cross does not really involve humanity, but is merely God's internal act of balancing a legal ledger. So the critical question we must ask is this, does the atonement fix God or does it heal humanity? Are we reconciled to God, or is God reconciled to God's self? PSA implies that God must first fix God's own need to punish sin before we can be justified and forgiven. But think that through. Really think through the notion of forgiveness. Is that what forgiveness is? If God must first get payment for sin before we are forgiven, then forgiveness is not the right word here at all. Because the reality is forgiveness means to let someone go despite the debt that they owe you, not because someone else has paid it. To still demand payment is not forgiveness. However, letting the sinner go scot-free is forgiveness. So PSA distorts the very meaning of forgiveness by subjecting it to an abstract concept of divine justice. The cross is not the revelation of a legal payment being made but of God's radical acceptance of humanity in spite of its sinfulness. Christ suffered and died on the cross to heal humanity, to put an end to the wound of sin, to put to death the old nature, and to make a new creation out of his resurrection. It is not about satisfying some legal transaction, but about healing the sinner and restoring them to fellowship with the triune God. So I think we will understand the cross far better when we interpret it more in terms of relational healing and less in terms of an abstract transactional payment which takes place over our head. God's response to sin is not a legal one, but a relational one. God responds 
with relationship. God's wrath against sin is like the wrath of a surgeon cutting cancer out of the body. It is because God loves us that God's wrath burns against sin. Sin, however, must be healed, not punished in some sort of legal myth. I mean, if you really think through this concept, uh, how would punishing sin actually help the sinner? It does very little to help the sinner at all. In fact, it, it does basically nothing. To satisfy a legal desire to merely punish sin only reconciles God to human beings. It doesn't reconcile human beings to God, as the scriptures say. And so this transactional legalistic framework is highly problematic on a theological level, but on a scriptural level as well. But we'll return to that in the next video. Now, the theologian T.F. Torrance emphasizes the fact that the atonement must be internally linked with the incarnation. So it is not an event of external dispute, a transaction, or a legal process of exchange, but rather it is God's condescension to our fallen condition to heal us from our estrangement from God. God in Christ rescues us from the pit of darkness and transfers us to God's kingdom of light, as Paul put it in Colossians. The stress here is on rescue, on restoring us to a right relationship with God and healing our fallen humanity. The stress is not on the cross being some sort of transaction. Now, returning to the idea of violence in this theory, if God condones violence, if God solves sin by acting violently, we have validated violence as a good because God uses it. It's central to our faith. It's central to what we profess. Yet ethically and politically, this is not only incongruent with the teachings of Christ, but it is dangerous in a world where nuclear war is an ever-present existential threat hanging over us. Violence is no longer a viable option. Thus, from the start, God must be situated not on the side of the violent perpetrator, as he is in PSA, but on the side of the victims of violence and all those who suffer under the weight of oppression. Our God is not the God of those who wield power for violent ends. God is with the victims of violence. God is the God of the oppressed, who sides with the poor and weak, not the mighty and strong. Thus, both the transactional and violent dimensions of PSA are theologically indefensible for the doctrine of God. A third theological problem with PSA is the way it seems to imply a split in the being of God between Father and Son, and as a result, it fails to understand the true goal of atonement itself. For this, um, we should examine a commonly asked and misunderstood question. Was the Son forsaken by the Father on the cross? When he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was this a literal event wherein the Father turned his back on Jesus? Or is something else going on here? We should first recognize that Christ is quoting Psalm 22. And while this psalm begins with that famous phrase, uh, it does not end with the same sense of forsakenness. In fact, while it begins with the feeling that God has forsaken the psalmist, it ends with the very opposite conclusion that even though he may have felt forsaken, in reality, God never left him. Verse 24 concludes, For he did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. So on the cross, the Father did not forsake the Son. They were one and undivided. This is further seen when we remember Christ's prayer of trust and hope. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now, even though this psalm and the other sayings of Christ from the cross make very clear that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross, uh, let's consider for a moment the idea that Jesus felt forsaken. On the cross, Christ assumed the darkness of our fallen condition in order to put an end to the old nature and make a new reality in and through his resurrection. This is the meaning of the forsakenness of the cross. Jesus was not ontologically forsaken, but he took upon himself our condition. He healed our sinfulness from the inside, reconciling us to the Father. As Gregory of Nazianzus states, the unassumed is the unhealed. For Christ to heal our alienation from God, he must assume it as his own and thus heal it from the inside. Christ was not forsaken by the Father. The Trinity remained undivided on the cross. Yet even still, God entered into our estrangement and thus penetrated our sense of God-forsakenness in order to heal 
our alienation and reconcile us to the Father. Another idea that's related is this idea that the Father turned his back on the Son because God cannot look upon sin. But there are two severe problems with this. First of all, if God cannot truly look upon sin, then the very heart of our faith is null and void. This is the truth that God became a man in Jesus Christ, that God tabernacled among sinners. Uh, now, this tends to be rooted in the idea that because God is perfect and holy, although these terms are often just defined in some sort of legal, legalistic way, um, but because of God's holiness, um, God must forsake Jesus in punishing sin uh, because God cannot look upon sin. Uh, but the Incarnation proves that this is entirely a false way of thinking. Uh, God became a man. The Word became flesh. Because if God cannot look upon sin, then the Son cannot become sin for us, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians. So this is simply nonsense when we actually examine Christ's life. He entered into the world of sinners and took up residence among the least of these. So how can we then maintain that God cannot look upon sin? This is a baseless, legalistic fantasy that is often told together with PSA, but it is theologically inconsistent with the God revealed in Christ. The second problem with this idea that God forsakes the Son is that it is an offense to the Trinitarian unity of the Godhead because it creates a rift between the bond of the Trinity itself, thus threatening the very Godness of God. It is theologically problematic to hold an atonement theory that rejects one of the most essential truths of the doctrine of God, namely the inseparability of Father and Son, the unity of substance, the oneness and being and act. According to T.F. Torrance, uh, this oneness and being and act is the very heart of our faith and without which there is no good news at all. Torrance writes quite profoundly of Christ's cry of God forsakenness on the cross, and he further explains the centrality of divine unity. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This was a cry of utter God forsakenness, the despairing cry of man in his dereliction, which Jesus has made his own, taking it over from the 22nd Psalm, thereby revealing that he had penetrated into the ultimate horror of great darkness, the abysmal chasm that separates sinful man from God. But there, in the depths where we are exposed to the final judgments of God, Jesus converted man's atheistical shout of abandonment and desolation into a prayer of commitment and trust. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The Son and the Father were one and not divided, each dwelling in the other, even in that hour and power of darkness. In Jesus, God himself descended to the very bottom of our human existence where we are alienated and antagonistic into the very hell of our godlessness and despair. Laying fast hold of us and taking our cursed condition upon himself, in order to embrace us forever in his reconciling love. So we again see that Christ's cry of abandonment on the cross was not his, but it was ours. He assumed it in union with the Father in order to transform our atheistical cry, our alienation, into a prayer of trust and faithfulness. Christ acted vicariously as a human being to uphold the Godward motion of grace, wherein we respond to God in the response of Christ. I briefly talked about this idea of the vicarious humanity of Christ, which is so essential for T.F. Torrance's theology, so I won't go over that point again, uh, but Torrance summarizes this view simply when he writes, Jesus Christ is our human response to God. So it is vital to see here that this cry on the cross is not a literal declaration of an event that actually took place of God forsaking Jesus, but rather it proclaims the success of Christ's condescension to our humanity in the very pit of our God forsakenness. Another observation here that I cannot help but notice is how penal substitution tends to neglect the role of the Holy Spirit in all of this. If it is true, as St. Augustine maintained, that the Spirit is the bond of love between Father and Son, then it is an affront against the person of the Holy Spirit whenever we claim that the Father abandoned the Son. So it is problematic, to say the least, if not heretical, to claim that the bond between Father and Son was broken on the cross, even temporarily. God was united in the event of the Atonement. As the bond of love between Father and Son, the Holy Spirit is not to be overlooked in the Atonement, 
the cross was a Trinitarian event. Finally, let's look at what is probably the most serious issue with this idea that God forsakes Jesus, and that is the pastoral issue. Um, namely, it is the issue that it fails to proclaim what is the true goal of atonement. T.F. Torrance writes, Yet it is not atonement that constitutes the goal and end of that integrated movement of reconciliation, but union with God in and through Jesus Christ, in whom our human nature is not only saved, healed, and renewed, but lifted up to participate in the very light, life, and love of the Holy Trinity. The goal of Christ's death and of the atonement is union with God. It is not an abstract, transactional satisfaction of payment. The problem with this conception of the atonement is that God acts over our heads. Not actually healed or redeemed, but God merely resolves God's own internal issues with sin. But that is a complete failure to understand the heart of the gospel, that we are united to God and Christ. Union with Christ is thus the goal of the atonement, and PSA fails to make this central uh, by its transactional focus. Together with this, there's also the minor critique that we can bring, kind of connected with all of this, um, and that is that PSA tends to downplay the importance of the resurrection, and it also devalues the life of Christ lived for our salvation. So the theory excludes reflection on the life of Christ and the resurrection of Christ as anything other than the background staging uh, or proof of the success of the transaction of the cross. But that is a severe affront against Christ's life and resurrection. Now, the final problem I want to consider is the pastoral implications of PSA. If it is true that Jesus saves us from God, which is essential to the message of PSA, then how does that affect the way that we believers respond to the Father? If the Father is lifted up as sort of this violent uh, abuser, and Jesus is the one who saves us, who saves us from God, and thus saves us for God, then this is going to have drastic effects on the way that we think about the Father. And so the unity of the being and act of the Father and Son is violated in PSA because the Father is now the one that we need saving from rather than the one to whom Christ reconciles us. Pastorally, it is clear that many in the church have warm feelings about Jesus Christ, but often harbor a fearful or distant posture towards God the Father. The Father is often seen as the dark side of God. And thus, as a result, PSA has created a God behind the back of Jesus Christ. Karl Barth and T.F. Torrance have stressed over and over again in their theologies that there is no God behind the back of Jesus Christ, and that this is the very heart of the gospel itself. Yet PSA makes it hard to believe that this is so, or at the very least it seems to undermine the message that the Father and Son are one and undivided. Christians know that Jesus loves them, in fact many non-Christians know that, uh, but when it comes to God the Father, they are less sure. There is a psychological divide between what we think of God the Father and what we think of Jesus Christ, and this is no small matter pastorally. We have to consider very seriously why this is the case. It is not hard to imagine that this is a direct result of the kind of narrative we tell about the cross, and ultimately that is what atonement theories actually are. They are stories of interpretive significance. And the story PSA tells is one of an angry God and a merciful God who then saves us from the angry God. So it should be no surprise then that we do not automatically generate warm and fuzzy feelings about the formerly angry God the Father. As a narrative, PSA leads us to reject God the Father, or at the very least fear him, which undermines the very heart of reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not himself to the world. God was in Christ not reconciling the Father to the world, but the world to God. And so God's anger did not need fixing. Our sin needed fixing. Now, of course, correlation does not mean causation, so it is again not necessarily inherent to PSA, nor would any of its proponents tell you that God the Father and or the Son are necessarily different gods. But this is still too pastorally problematic to risk the very heart of our faith namely the oneness and being an act of the Father and Son, for a widely contested and theologically questionable theory of the atonement. And so ultimately, what a lot of this comes down to is reversing the narrative about the atonement. Penal substitution makes the claim that the atonement acts upon God, 
that God is the object of the atonement. But that reverses the narrative that's very clearly shown in Scripture. Uh, it is not God who needs fixed, but humanity. It's not God who needs healed, it's humanity. It's not God that needs reconciled, it's humanity. And so to make God into the object of the atonement, to in some way imply a split between the merciful God and the angry God, is severely problematic, not only on theological, ethical uh, terms, but especially in the pastoral implications of this. Um, I'll just speak personally. I, um, of course, grew up in the in the church thinking of quite highly of Jesus Christ, but I, I think that in the back of my mind there was always this sense of fear about God the Father. Now a lot of this came um, out in my eschatology, where I thought that the God who was going to come uh, in the second coming would be a God wholly different than Jesus Christ. Uh, and that God was the God, the Father, the God that I was afraid of. And so I, I can speak personally that this is a psychological reality for a lot of people who hear penal substitution being proclaimed as the only way of interpreting the gospel. So I think at the very least, we should be hesitant when we come against a psychologically damaging theory and perhaps start to question it. Now, finally, in conclusion, I want to stress here that penal substitution is a theory. It is not written in stone, and as we'll show in the next video, it really isn't clearly written out in the scriptures. Um, ultimately, it is a human-made attempt to comprehend the incomprehensible glory of reconciliation in Christ. Gregory of Nyssa once said, Concepts create idols. Only wonder understands. PSA can easily become an idol when it becomes the only way we are allowed to interpret the meaning of Christ's cross. And many in the church have taken up this mantle and have become self-designated heresy hunters. And they're quick to reject anyone who might find issues with this theory. But the reality is, it is just a theory about the cross. Ultimately, to use a phrase borrowed from T.F. Torrance, the atonement is more adored than expressed. Whenever our theology becomes more important than our doxology, or better stated, whenever theology and doxology are split apart, we will find ourselves in dangerous waters. Here, there be idols. So we have to keep a level head when it comes to the atonement. As the central event of our faith, we have to remain in a posture of wonder and adoration, rather than holding on too tightly to our dogmatic belief in a concept. May we never forget that theology is worship that adoration must be central to everything we say about God. I pray that the fires of wonder and mystery are never put out by our concepts and dogmas. The last thought I want to leave you with is this. The atonement is not a theory or a doctrine. Ultimately, it is a person. Jesus Christ is the atonement. It is the movement of God into the far country to be for us the means of our reconciliation. But to discuss the atonement as if Jesus were merely a agent, a pawn in God's drama, is a grievous mistake. Jesus is atonement, and in assuming our flesh, he healed us. In dying our death, he made an end to the old nature. And by being raised to life again, there is new creation in him. This refocuses our attention not on some sort of transaction, but rather on participation on our solidarity with Christ and his solidarity with us. Because according to Paul, we were on that cross with Jesus. We were crucified with Christ. And in his crucifixion, he put to death our old nature. So when all of the theories and the ideas fade away, what's left is the person of Jesus Christ, who is our atonement. So when it comes down to it, if you were to ask me today what atonement theory I hold, I would say, it is not a theory, ultimately, but a name, Jesus Christ, who for our sakes lived and died in the power of the Spirit and was raised to the right hand of the Father. Theories can be a helpful place to begin, but they must never become an end unto themselves. Ultimately, the atonement is a mystery. Our feeble attempts to interpret its meaning are nothing unless they point beyond themselves to the greater reality that is Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you benefited from this video. In the next one, I will discuss the scriptures, which are typically used to defend penal substitution.
Uh, so keep an eye for that one. Um, that will obviously complete this part as we've only started with kind of laying the conceptual framework for the problems with PSA. Um, but for now, I just want to say thank you so much for watching and have a great day.